The idea of the portfolio life is simply that you can and should build a portfolio for your career, your hobbies, your community, your commitments that is diversified and gives you optionality and flexibility. <laughs> Hey, Christina, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Max. How's, uh, how's your Friday? It's been a long week. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got a new book uh, coming out, right? So like, what's your, what's your plans and strategies for that? I do. I have the new book coming out. I'm doing like podcasts, interviews, excerpts, tour. I've got some travel coming up and it's all coming on the heels of finishing the fall semester of teaching at Harvard Business School. Um, literally the book comes out like the day after I'm done teaching. So, uh, I feel like in some ways I'm sprinting to the start line. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you say you, you teach a uh, business, uh, at Harvard, uh, mm -hmm. do a lot of those students, uh, have some uncertainty of the job market right now? Yes, that's an understatement. The, uh, the confidence that everyone felt at the beginning of the academic year just dissipated about six, eight weeks in. And now there's just a lot of uncertainty where folks had offers and they're being pushed out. They had offers that got rescinded. Um, they had offers from companies that no longer exist at this point. So it's, there's a fair bit of, uh, of uncertainty everywhere right now. And in a way that's kind of the old playbook, as you mentioned in your book, uh, mm -hmm. and the new playbook, the new model, uh, called the portfolio life that should be what people should be focusing on. So can you tell us more about the, the Portfolio Life book that you created and why is it a good time to create this book uh, at this point in time? Sure. So um, I pitched this book a couple of years back and it was, you know, the great resignation was happening and, every, you know, workers had all the power in the moment. I was like, is this still going to be applicable by the time the thing comes out? And it turns out everything, uh, everything has shifted. So it is... Um, painfully relevant. So the idea of the portfolio life is simply uh, that you can and should build a portfolio for your career, your hobbies, your community, your, your commitments that is diversified and gives you optionality and flexibility because that is what is going to help you sustain a life in a world that is constantly being disrupted. These sort of uh, world changing disruptions, they kind of seem to be happening every couple of years at this point. And that, that pace is not slowing down. And so with that amount of uncertainty, you, the, it's very unlikely that you're going to pick the one right answer and drive toward it in your life and have it pan out. You have to build in diversification just like we do with our financial portfolios. So you said you pitched this book a few years ago, right? Um, how did this idea came to fruition. Like how did you discover the portfolio life and built it and built that portfolio life around your own life and then uh, went into a book to teach other people? Sure. So I have been living this life since I was a kid. I loved to do all of the things growing up. I was a math nerd. I studied classical music. I got to college. I double majored in math and theater, I triple minored physics, music, political science. I wanted to do all the things. And anytime someone wanted me to focus, I really chafed at that idea. I mean, I, I thought there's obviously value in becoming excellent at something, but I didn't see why I needed to pare back my interests and my ambitions in order to just pursue one thing. So I have always built a career and a life, you know, whether I'm getting paid for it or whether these are things that I'm pursuing uh, on my own, on the side, I've, I've always built a life that had lots of different moving pieces all at once and could be opportunistic based on what happened to pop up for the next chapter or the next iteration. And so I, I've been doing this and I've been talking about it and writing about it in small ways for over a decade. I was a columnist for Forbes for many years. That's where a number of these ideas first germinated. I've given speeches and talks about these things. And I kept hearing from readers and folks who'd come across this content that this resonated for them, that they saw themselves 
in this model. And it felt like it gave them permission to continue to do what they were doing to, to be themselves and build this life because there was a name for it. It was a, it made it a thing, right? It made it official. Um, and so finally I was like, look, if it's, if it's hitting a nerve with enough people, why not pull it all together and turn it into a book? And the portfolio life is based on the idea is based on three ideas, right? The first is that you are more than just one role and one opportunity uh, is, is important to diversify. And then, Similar to a financial portfolio, you always got to rebalance it, right? Um, what, depending on how the market changes. So how did those ideas uh, build up into the portfolio life framework? Yeah, so it starts from this question of identity, right? Who, who are we? And I think for many Americans, when you ask someone, you meet them at a party or, I don't know, standing waiting for the elevator, you're like, oh, who are you? we introduce ourselves with our job title. That's kind of how we identify as a culture. And the challenge there is if you identify as your job, your identity can be taken away from you. Whether you're fired or you're laid off or your entire industry disappears, if who you are is what you do, who you are is at risk. And so it starts from this question of how do we see ourselves and what do we bring to the table and how do I, we identify beyond just the value of our labor today? The second piece, diversification, is really about that uncertainty. Um, you cannot build a deliberate strategy for a world that is unknown. And so you have to build an emergent strategy, a, a, a diversified strategy that says, I don't know what is going to come tomorrow or the year after. I don't know how AI is going to affect industries. I know there will be disruptions. And so I need to have multiple bets, just like a venture capitalist does when they invest, just like your parents do in their retirement investments, right? Diversification allows for risk and uncertainty and still can give you the reward, the returns that you need, knowing not everything is going to pan out, but something will. And then the last piece, rebalancing, this is crucial. We are wholly different people for every chapter of our lives. We need different things. We want different things. We have different priorities. And this notion that you're coming out of college, you picked a major, you picked a job, and that you at 22 or 25 or 35 is going to know what you at 45 and 55 and 65 need is absurd. And so it, it gives you permission to say, am I in a new chapter of my life? Okay, then let's rebalance. I, I recently had two small children. <laughs> They're one and three years old. My life looks very different right now than it did five to 10 years ago. So giving yourself permission to rebalance, knowing it's just for this chapter and I can do it again when I hit my next chapter. You, you already touched upon a few of the uh, four pillars, right? Identity, mm -hmm. diversification, and then flexibility, which is similar to rebalancing. And then the other mm -hmm. pillar is optionality. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you tell us more about how these four like synergize uh, and work together uh, in each of the pillars to create your portfolio life? Sure. So, I mean, identity has to start at the beginning because the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves can dictate how we even see the world, how we see what our options are, how we see whether or not there's flexibility. And if we ha tell ourselves a story that I am this narrowly defined person, I am this job, I am this industry, and we forget all of the multidimensionality that we had in childhood, that we even had in our young adult stage. All the interests, the skills, the networks and relationships we have. If we lose sight of that, we are literally paring back our superpowers. Like those, those strange kind of connections and interests and intersections, that's the unique perspective we bring to the table. So this has to start with identity and really establishing an identity, a layer up, a, a beyond what you do today. And then optionality is really about, it sort of goes hand in hand with diversification. Optionality says at any given point, 
you have options. There are doors that are open. And yes, there might be doors that close by virtue of you making a choice moving forward. But but there will always be options. In particular, because the world is changing so fast, new options are becoming available that you didn't even realize a few years ago were on the were on the horizon. So so being uh, aware of and open to the different directions that you can take your life in rather than seeing, well, I, I set off on my path and now it has to be a straight line from here. Just being aware of that optionality will, will let you see how many choices you have available to you. Diversification is really just about risk and reward. And this also goes hand in hand with failure. So there are, there are so many reasons why we might fail at something in life. And some of it can be our own decisions. And many of reasons are things outside of our control. And so the, the opportunity to diversify income streams, interests, networks, industries, whatever that is, it gives you that ability to say, not everything is going to work. I don't have control of all of the pieces right now. And that's okay. I've got enough bets that the portfolio will deliver, even if each individual investment might not. And the last one in flexibility, this one is crucial because as we go through these different stages of our life, we need different things. With young children, I need a lot more autonomy, control over my calendar. I I still work just as hard as I did before I have kids, but I'm doing it at very different times of the day or the week than I used to because kids are constantly getting sick and they constantly need things. So I have the ability to adjust how and when I, I do the things in my portfolio, I show up for my commitments for this stage of life. And this is really powerful because in a previous era, once you had kids, for example, you were expected to quit your job and stay home. It was on or off, all or nothing. And it doesn't have to be that way now. So a portfolio gives you that ability, that flexibility to design what you need for the stage you're at. You touched upon a few things. Uh, first is that uh, life is not linear. Second is you do have to take risks. And then third is that uh, there are some things that are going to be beyond your control. Uh, and one of the things is about uh, the portfolio life is that it's not a linear st uh, straight line or linear up, so to speak. There are going to be twists and turns and those twists and turns comes with failure. But you mentioned that in your book, that failure is not always a bad thing. It is, is, could actually be a good thing. And you also mentioned that failure is sometimes out of our control as well. So can you elaborate mm -hmm. on those two points uh, just to help ease my audience into the portfolio life <laughs> if they sure. are a very avo uh, avoidant of failure? I mean, I was avoidant of failure. I get it. It's like the F word. Um, I had never failed at anything until my first company failed. And that, it really threw me for a loop how destabilizing that felt because part of my identity was I am someone who succeeds. And the problem with that mentality, that narrative, is that if I am someone who succeeds and there's a chance that I might fail at something, I'm probably not going to try it. And so I'm literally, if we talk about optionality, I'm taking options out of my, my set by not even being willing to try something if I fear that I could fail. So developing a comfort with failure, developing that muscle that says, I'm going to try it, even if I'm not guaranteed to be amazing, even if I don't know how this is going to turn out, I'm going to try. That opens up so many possibilities and the sting of failure gets less <laughs> as you as you practice it, as you get better at it. And what you realize is, yes, there are some failures that are problematic. Failures where you hurt people, you break laws, you do things that are irreversible. But most failures are not in that category. They are, I tried this job and I wasn't very good at it. I, I, I went to build a business. It didn't pan out. I thought I would be great at basketball. Turns out I'm not great at basketball. Whatever these things are, 
being willing to try gets you closer to the things that you will be good at because you're willing to get out there and be in the arena. So speaking of which, um, again, a lot, a lot of the younger generation want to avoid failure, right? Uh, yeah. You talk about in your book about you have to be comfortable in terms of practicing to fail. So can you elaborate more on like how do how to choose a task to practice failing in uh, to like build up that muscle over time? Yes, yes, I love this. So I I love this idea of practicing failure because if you can learn to fail at small things you are much less likely to fail at big things. So here's what I mean. In the startup world, we talk a lot about running experiments. In the startups, you're building new things, something that doesn't exist yet. You've got to figure things out. There's a lot of moving pieces. And there's a way that you can design little tests that teach you what your customers need, whether what you've built fits them, whether there's a business model that works for you. If you can design these small experiments, and maybe some of them fail, you can prevent the whole business from failing because you can course correct before you get too far down any path. And it's the same way for the rest of your life. So when I wanted to get better at failing, I knew I needed to build this muscle and I wanted to do it in a way that had absolutely no actual cost to my life. And so I decided to start up running. Now I am not a gifted athlete. Uh, I am tall. Everyone wanted me to be great at basketball. I am not. Um, and so I knew that running, particularly long distance running, half marathons, full marathons, this would be a challenge. And I suppose in one version of my world, I could go and be the kind of type A competitive person that I am and come up with a whole training regimen and become excellent at running. But that wasn't the point of this process. The point of this process was to show up and practice being bad at something. And so I, I just took up running and I'm very slow and a half marathon can take two and a half hours when you're really slow. But that gave me the, the chance to rewrite my narrative. So that instead of the story that says, I succeed when I try things, I had a new story that said, I show up and I try really hard, even if I'm not guaranteed to win. And changing that mentality gave me permission to show up and try really hard in other spaces. When it comes to uh, changing your mentality, uh, and like, as you said, practicing to fail, we are sometimes our, our worst critic. And the other thing I want to mention is when it comes to like making career pivots, uh, the, the general th consensus is to do some self-reflection. But in your book, you said that's not actually the right approach. The right approach is to reach out to different people in your network to ask um, questions about yourself. Uh, to help like build up the uh, narrative that you think would be best for you. So in regards to that, um, how what people should you reach out to and what questions should you ask to build up the right narrative for you? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, self-reflection absolutely has its place. And there are definitely exercises in the book where I want you to to be reflective and think think inside your own head and come up with answers. But in some ways, it can be really helpful to get out of your head. And, and in particular, see how other people see you. Because you might be surprised at what sticks with people long after you're gone. That might not have ever occurred to you to be something that you could or should emphasize. So I, I did this particular exercise for the first time after my first company failed, mostly because I was paralyzed. I, I did not know who or what I was or what I had to offer the world. I No amount of self-reflection was going to fix that, so I had to go outside. And this was important, I think. I, I reached out to a wide range of folks, people that I'd worked with, people I went to school with, people that had known me for six months, people that had known me for 10 years. I really wanted a range of perspectives, particularly because I had had such 
a zigzag life up to that point. I had worked in theater, in a physics lab, in opera. Uh, I had worked in management consulting. I had gone to business school. I mean, all over the map. And I wanted to know, am I the same person in every room? Like, wh what do they see? And so I asked them three questions. I said, when have you seen me happiest? What do you come to me for? Like, what's that moment where you're like, you know what? I should see what Christina has to say about this. And where do I stand out against my peers? Which I think, honestly, is probably the most valuable of the three. Because there are many times where there's a, a skill or a particular way of thinking or working that might come naturally to you. So you don't realize how rare it is or how valuable it is or how, how many other people struggle with it. That once you recognize that is highly valued in your sector, in your network, in your community, you might decide to build an entire career around that skill rather than saying, oh, I need to be well-rounded. It's this idea of, no, go be well lopsided. Find that thing you're amazing at and double down on that. And once you get enough data, whether it's asking uh, the right questions or doing some self-reflection, uh, the, the overall arching theme is the portfolio life, but there's mm -hmm. uh, three main portfolios uh, beneath that, right? The subsegment, so to speak. You got the moonlighters, the zigzaggers, and then the multi-hyphenates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so can you, uh, <laughs> quick, I think I said that right. Can you yes. help me uh, elaborate on each of these and which one would be a right fit for uh, specific individuals? Sure. So. This, the idea underneath it is that there, there's a business model for your life. And that business model might look very different for you than it does for your best friend. And identifying sort of what you need and what you want and how you put those things together is crucial for setting up the right format. So the three models that I outlined, these are three of the most common portfolio life models, but they're not the only ones. The three are, um, as you said, the moonlighters, zigzaggers, and multi-hyphenates. Now, moonlighters is an idea that you have a principal day job, and then you have something you do on the side. Now, that thing on the side could be monetized. It might be a business or consulting work or freelance, or it might be a really significant hobby, something you deeply care about. It might be something brand new that you just really want to learn. So you're going all in, your nights, weekends, um, doing a, a week-long immersions uh, on your vacation, whatever that thing is. But you have a principal day job. And that day job might be a good enough job, right? It, it could be like Albert Einstein at the Swiss patent office who loved his day job because it was unchallenging and it gave him the space to think about physics. So it doesn't have to be the love of your life job. It could be a perfectly fine job, but it gives you the space, the income, the stability to invest in your moonlighting project. The second model, zigzagging, sometimes, many times, comes out of a moonlighting project where you say you're doing this one thing as your job, as your life, and then you want to do something else that looks completely unrelated on the surface. And you have to make sense of that zigzag to the folks that are trying to hire you, to the people that you want to work with, because otherwise they'll be like, what's going on? Are you flaky? Are you a dilettante? Like, why are you changing course here? And so it's this idea that like maybe you were building something up on the side, moonlighting, you were, you were learning to code, or you were building a small business, or you were, I don't know, going to medical school. And then you decided, okay, I'm ready. I'm at the point to elevate this moonlighting project to become my day job. And now I'm going to zigzag from what I used to do to what I'm doing now. The third model, multi-hyphenates, it's a little bit like the moonlighting model, except instead of having a principal day job and then a very clearly defined side thing, you're doing multiple things at once that are, that are roughly equally weighted, equally important in your life. And this might be something that they are separate lines of work, 
Or it could be something where you are finding the way to mash them up and create a whole new line of work. So I give an example in the book of, uh, of a woman who was a playwright and also a computer programmer. And for a while, she was an engineer in tech and writing and directing plays all over the world. Unrelated work, both meaningful to her. And then at one point, she got an opportunity to join the TED Fellows Program and mash these two worlds together to think about the future of art as it is applied and interpreted through technology. And because she had lived in both worlds simultaneously, it made her effectively one of the foremost leading experts at that intersection. Great. And you mentioned those in those uh, three common portfolios. Uh, it, it was very like career and job focused, right? But um, in order to have a good balanced portfolio, you can't just focus on your uh, career. You have to focus on the other things as well in your life to make it yourself more balanced, such as like relationships, hobbies, health, finance, etc. So uh, why is going beyond just uh, work and focusing on the other areas as well so crucial to having a well-balanced portfolio? The reason I call this the portfolio life and not portfolio career is because your work is in the context of your life. And there may be times where your portfolio is, for example, a day job and a side hustle. That's your moonlighting gig. You're monetizing both of them. Or there may be times when you have the day job and you have a hobby. You have an interest, a class, a community, a sub, right? It, the monetization of your, of your moonlighting project doesn't make it any more or less valuable to you if it is part of your portfolio and means something. So it's this notion that your work is in the context of your life. And as you think about your life, for you to be sustained, <laughs> for you to be happy, you, you need relationships, you need rest. You will likely need growth, personal growth, opportunities to try new things. And if you are only managing the monetized part of your portfolio, you'll only make space for the monetized part of your portfolio. And everything else, whether or not you want it, won't have space to show up. So it's this notion, you know, the Peter Drucker quote, you, you measure, you manage what you measure. And so it's this notion of you have to be thoughtful about all of the things that matter to you and put them together in a holistic portfolio because an hour is an hour is an hour and you have to decide, does this go to study, work, sleep, hanging out with my best friend, snuggling with my kid, wherever that might be. Everything is going to come in some ways at the expense of other things. And the best way to balance this and to keep track of how you use your time is what you call the personal balance scorecard, correct? So <laughs> yeah. how, do you, uh, how do people, uh, like when people read the book, they'll see uh, an image of how it works. But can you elaborate for us um, on how people can use the uh, personal balance scorecard to help balance their life? Sure. So when I first was developing this idea, I thought, okay, well, how am I going to keep track of, of whether or not I'm living the life I say I want? If I'm only managing and measuring my career goals, which are, are often really easy to measure. You know if you got promoted, you know if you got a raise, you know if you won some award. You know, it's, it's not hard to have a sense of how your professional life is going. But it can be a lot harder to keep track of, am I showing up for my friends? Am I investing in my health? Am I being thoughtful about, I don't know, uh, investing in you know, long-term financial uh, sustainability as well as covering tomorrow's rent? I wanted a tool that would give me the same holistic view as I was saying I cared about for my life. So I took this tool from the business world called the Balance Scorecard, and I made it personal. And the, the point of this is you start with the big sort of strategic priorities for your life. I kind of divided mine into four, professional, personal, health, and financial. 
And then within those strategic priorities, I had specific goals for them, four, five, six goals for each. And then against those goals, I would set actual targets that I could drive toward in a given time frame. Maybe you do it on an annual basis. Maybe you do it every quarter. But I say like, this is how I, I know whether or not I'm reaching those goals. And then I kept track and I checked back in every six months or so. And I left myself some notes along the way of like, you hit this goal. That's great. Let's keep it up for next year. Or crucially, when I didn't hit a goal, then the question was, well, why? Was it not the right goal? Was it that I didn't define the goal well enough? It was hard to say whether or not I hit it because it wasn't really measurable. Or was it because I say I want this, but I never actually was willing to put the time into it? So a great example of this was the first time I set this up, one of my goals in my personal uh, growth was to practice cello again. I played cello for many, many years growing up and I still have it it's literally sitting in the corner right there, but I hadn't cracked open the case in a couple of years. So I thought I'm going to start practicing cello again. I am going to practice three times a week. Well, you would probably not be surprised to know I did not meet that goal. I think I maybe cracked the case open twice in the whole year. And I said, okay, well, why, why did I set that goal? And then why did I miss it so badly? I said, well, I set that goal because I really miss making music. I don't want to just listen to music. I don't want to just attend other people's performances. I want to make music myself. And the reason I didn't hit the goal is because in my head, practicing cello means doing scales and etudes and all of the boring crap from high school that isn't very fun. So I'm not surprised that if what I want to do is play music again, but I think the outlet for that is practicing scales, that like, I'm not going to choose to do that work. But then I reflected and realized I did make music that year. I had created an acapella group with a whole bunch of other tech nerds. We were called NYC Sharp, because uh, C Sharp is a programming language. Also a musical note. And, and we sang, we did gigs all over the city. We rehearsed every week. We had so much fun. And I said, well, I, I did make music this year, just not exactly how I thought I would. And so it's a good reminder that actually a lot of this work goes into the setting of the goals and so much less work goes into the tracking of it. Once you figure out what you care about and you set the, those goals, then it's actually really easy to know if you're following through. Speaking of goals, uh, one of the things is like we might have uh, all these goals that we want to complete, uh, but sometimes we need accountability as well. And this is in the next part of your book in terms of building your team. Uh, however, most people generally think about building a team as in finding mentors, but you want people to uh, think of it a different way, which is seeking directors instead. Can you elaborate more on this seeking director uh, component and what do people need to look out for, for to find those directors? Sure. So I hate the term mentor. Um, I, I get where it's going, but I, I just, I feel like this is a concept that works in theory. And yet I've never met anyone who can actually point to like, ah, this is my mentor. You know, like there's no Yoda just hanging out inside a company waiting to open the doors for you and tell you how everything works and care about your career. And so for many of us, millennials and Gen Z, we're sort of like, I feel like I'm failing at this thing that I don't even know it actually exists. So forget about this, you know, theoretical mentor. And instead, think about a board of directors like a CEO has for their company. So a board of directors is responsible for helping the CEO set strategic priorities helping them uh, manage uh, you know, their money, their negotiating uh, on, on um, salaries and setting compensation le levels. Um, they might help them through some really you know, gnarly uh, trouble, trouble spots along the way, right? This is a, a group of folks that each contribute a different skill or point of view along the way. 
And so I outline sort of five categories of people that you might consider having on your board of directors, but it's not, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be pedantic here. If there are other things that you care about, then get, get someone like that on your board of directors, but things like a coach, a cheerleader, a negotiator, a truth teller. These are folks who can be there for you in different ways and collectively you've got, you know, what you need to progress in your world. And it's also helpful as you think about your board of directors because if you have this portfolio, you sit in multiple worlds, you're going to need relationships in multiple worlds, in multiple networks. So having a connector who can introduce you to someone in the theater world is going to be different than the person you might need to be introduced to in the business world. And if you're looking for one magical mentor who can play all of these parts, you're never going to find them. So diversification of the people that you go to for advice is just as important as diversification of your portfolio. And the next part about building your team is partners or partnerships. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between a director and a partner and how do you find the right partner for you? So director is an advisor. This is someone you go to and say, hey, I need your thoughts on this. Or I wanted to check in with you on that and let you know how it's going. Thanks for your advice. A partner is someone who's in the game with you. So if you're starting a company, your your partner is your co-founder. You guys are working shoulder to shoulder every day, building this thing and making the tough decisions together. And in life, your partner is, you know, it could be a life partner. It could be someone that you are partnered up with for now. Um, it could be one of several partners. I, I know quite a few people who have successfully built polyamorous relationships because they know exactly what they need from each partner. You might also decide you don't want a partner. Maybe you get what you need from friends, from lovers. You, you don't want just one person that you're building your life with. So it always has to start from the place of, well, what are you looking for? What do you need? What do you want? Define that first rather than just following what is expected of you and going down a path that might not be a fit for you. Absolutely. And uh, we've, we've talked a lot about like planning and preparation uh, in the portfolio life so far. And uh, one of the things is that, yes, you may be able to do all the prep work, but opportunities are not just to come knock on your door. You still have to go out there and get that visibility uh, to attract those right opportunities for you. So in the next part of my uh, question here is how do people uh, build that visibility uh, and how to craft a story uh, that resonates with their uh, people in their target roles and industries. Yeah. So this is a tough one because when you live in multiple worlds, as portfolio lifers do, you don't always make sense on paper. <laughs> if you were to look at my LinkedIn, you might say, what on earth is going on with this chick? Or if you look at a resume, you're like, okay, you're bouncing all over. I see this. I see that. I have no idea who this person is. So the onus is on you to tell a clear and cohesive story about who you are, what you're interested in, and what you bring to the table. And that can be a challenge for people who are not you know, natural storytellers or don't have a ton of experience with this, this can be hard. This is why it's always so scary as a portfolio lifer when someone's like, ah, oh, tell me about yourself. And you're like, Ugh, do I have to? But yes, you do have to because often these opportunities, they don't come from your first degree network, the people that you know. They come from your second degree network, which is the people that they know. And there's a ton of research around this, but it basically comes down to really closely knit networks are all sharing the same information. But one degree out, you get access to new information, new leads, new opportunities. But if the people who know you don't know how to talk about you to the people they know, they're never going to bring your name up when something pops up. So you have to arm your network with the sentence 
or the paragraph that describes who you are and what you do. And what I love about that mentality is that it gets away from this fear of bragging. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I hate to talk about myself. I don't want to come across as a braggart. And I understand the fear. I really do. But I think in this case, you have to think about it from the perspective of my friends want to help me, but they're not going to be able to if they don't know how to talk about me. So I am solving their problem by giving them a really tight sentence or two that tells the story of who I am, what I offer, and what I'm looking for. And to wrap this uh, conversation up in terms of um, you've you got yourself out there, uh, you've created the plan, you've talked to the right people, you found your board directors, partners, if you choose to have partners. Uh, this is all about like taking action now, but it'd be reckless to not also think about the future. And as you said in your book, there's a lot of there's been a lot of disruption over the past few decades, like economically, politically, and ecologically. Uh, so how do you um, prepare and forecast the future? Uh, so even when the di disruptions do happen, sometimes, as you said, are actually for the better, uh, you are able to still uh, stick to your plan. Yeah. So this is the tricky part. It is so hard to plan for a future when you know disruptions are going to be part of it. And so planning is maybe not the right word. Instead, I like to think about it like chief strategy officers do, which is around forecasting. And this gives you the ability to sort of think through different scenarios and then be clear on, am I prepared for each of these different scenarios should they come to pass? So I talk in the book about, you know, thinking through probable scenarios, eh, probably likely to happen, plausible ones. Eh, I could see how, yeah, that's plausible. And then even possible. These are really unlikely, but they're not impossible, right? There's still a shred of chance that that could happen. And to then be prepared for each of those circumstances and even think through, and you can even do some sort of mental exercises of like walking yourself through the choices you would make, the trade-offs you might have to make, the, the tensions along the way, so that if and when that future occurs, you have basically this, this memory of already having to make that tough decision. And it makes you less likely to to be paralyzed, to freeze in that moment. And instead you are ready for, oh, I already know what I'm gonna do. Let's put that plan into motion. So let's talk about a disruption that's happened in the past few months, uh, AI, right? Like yes. GPT. <laughs> so, uh, so that's a huge disruption. And there's been yes. fears of like, oh, is AI gonna take over my job? So why don't we use a real life example right now in terms of that, like how should someone adapt their, or rebalance their portfolio to adapt to AI? Uh, it's a great question that I've literally been talking to everyone about. I finished writing this book and locked it in before ChatGPT was a word that anyone uh, had used. And now, like four months later, everything is completely changed. So, so here's the scary truth, right? Anything that can be sent to a ChatGPT or its equivalent is going to be. If there is, you know, you put a question in right now, you're playing around with it. You put a question in and it shoots out a three page, you know, essay on something or can give you an analysis of a stock or, right? Those are all things that people's jobs today are go write this, go synthesize that, go analyze the other. All of that absolutely will be outsourced to AI. So if that's what you do in your day job, it is incumbent upon you to upskill immediately, to think through, okay, what part of either my current role or other roles in this industry can't be sent out to a computer? Where is that human innovation, creativity, connecting of the dots? What are the pieces that can never be just automated? And how can I gain experience in those things? gain a, a point of view 
read up about them, do some studying, write up about it, get, get a perspective on what that is. Is there an opportunity in my current role to ask for a stretch project to build some, some breadcrumbs on my resume that I'm qualified to move in that direction? If not, are there moonlighting projects I can take on on the side to build that skill? And if there's nothing within my current industry that I think I could move into, if I'm looking around and I'm like, oh, this whole thing is going to be outsourced, then go back to your Venn diagram. What other things do you love? What other questions do you want to answer about the world? What other industries do you think are interesting? Go start building connections and experience and, and points of view because this is happening and you do not want to be the last one standing without a seat when the music stops. And for, for someone that goes out and grabs your book, uh, this is a lot of new information, new uh, way of thinking. So what is like, let's say what's one takeaway or one first step you want someone to action uh, from your book uh, to build up that portfolio life? Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, the first step is to start with your Venn diagram. I think many of us who have been out in the world for a while, out working 10, 15, 20 years, may have lost sight of all of the things that were once part of our Venn diagram, the things that we were interested in and excited about or the skills that we brought to the table. And I, there's a whole chapter on this in there. I really want you to, to give yourself permission to be expansive and interesting. And I, I call it a weirdly shaped puzzle piece. And I, I say this with love. We are all weirdly shaped puzzle pieces. And some of us have had to kind of whittle away and carve down some of our weirdness in order to fit into the box that has been our professional life to this point. And that box is about to disappear or implode. And so it doesn't do you any good to be shaped like a box. So go back, reacquaint yourself with the other parts of your Venn diagram. That is going to open your eyes to some of the interesting intersections and mashups and, and cutting edge of the future where you might be able to play a meaningful role. Great. Uh, I, again, really appreciate uh, you taking the time, Christina, to talk about The Portfolio Life, your new book. So how can people uh, find your book, uh, purchase it, and if there's any other things where there's bonuses or your website that they can uh, look more about you, uh, feel free to share. Yeah. So PortfolioLife.com has links to all the e-commerce retailers that I know about selling it. Obviously, you can also go to your local bookstore or your library. If they don't have it, ask them. They can stock it. And uh, at PortfolioLife.com also has some templates that you can download. So the personal balance scorecard template, um, a couple of others with Gantt charts and thinking about time management. So check that out for some great resources. And then you can always follow me on LinkedIn. Um, if you want to keep up with my writing or other ideas, other things that I'll share there. Um, and you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you really care about, I don't know, pictures of my kids. <laughs> and then when's the book coming out? April 18th in the US, April 20th in the UK and the Commonwealth. Okay. Thank you so much, Christina. Thanks, Max. Thank you so much for watching. For more content on careers, job search, and self-improvement, make sure to hit that subscribe button.